Paracresyl sulfate and endoxyl sulfate are gut bacteria-derived metabolites that negatively impact the kidney, heart, and endothelium. And that's what we'll see here. So starting in the colon, or more specifically inside the gut lumen, this is the inside of the tube or inside of the intestine, proteins that make their way to the large intestine are digested into peptides. And then those peptides are converted into amino acids. In this case, tyrosine and tryptophan which are converted by gut bacteria into paracresol. So tyrosine is converted into paracresol by gut bacteria, and tryptophan is converted into indole also by gut bacteria. So an increase in levels of these metabolites in the intestinal epithelial cells can either then diffuse or be transported into the bloodstream, and more specifically, the portal circulation, which connects the intestine to the liver. So now the liver has elevated levels of paracresol and indoxyl or indole, so indole is converted into indoxyl under oxidative conditions, but that's into the weeds, that's a mechanism for another day. So the liver attempts to detoxify these gut bacteria-derived metabolites by adding sulfate groups. So now we've got paracresyl sulfate and indoxyl sulfate. And one way to reduce circulating levels of these metabolites is by binding to albumin. And that's potentially important because free levels of paracresyl sulfate and indoxyl sulfate in blood damage the liver, heart, and endothelium. Now, unfortunately, albumin levels decline during aging, which is one way that levels of paracresyl sulfate and endoxyl sulfate can be increased in the blood during aging. Another is that the kidney is supposed to remove these metabolites, but kidney function declines during aging. So paracresyl sulfate, PCS, and endoxyl sulfate, IS, accumulate when kidney function is suboptimal. And accordingly, levels of these two metabolites increase during aging. And that's what we'll see here. So levels of indoxyl sulfate and paracresyl sulfate on the left. And then we've got data for people who are younger than 65 years and older than 65 years on the left and right, respectively. And then for both of these metabolites, these are circulating levels. We can see that indoxyl sulfate increases from 1.22 to 1.55 micromolar. And P uh, PCS, or paracresyl sulfate, increases from 3.83 to 4.9 micromolar in people younger than versus older than 65. And these differences are statistically significant. As you can see, the p-value in both cases is less than 0.05. So in addition to these age-related increases for PCS and IS, they're also associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, which is what we'll see here. So on the top of the y-axis, we've got tyrosine-derived compounds, and there's paracresol sulfate. And on the bottom, we've got tryptophan-derived compounds, and there we've got indoxyl sulfate. On the x-axis, we've got the hazard ratio, so risk of death for all causes. And then in terms of what's significant, we put up a red line at that hazard ratio of one. Remember, we're the 95% confidence interval. That's the horizontal line to the left and right of the open circles, the unfilled white circles. If that's completely to the right or completely to the left of that hazard ratio of one, we have a significant association. So we can see that for both paracresyl sulfate it's 95% confidence interval is completely to the right of one as it is for indoxyl sulfate. So both of these metabolites are significantly associated with an incre increased risk of death for all causes. Now, the good news is that these metabolites can be tracked, which means they can be potentially optimized. And to do that, I've been using at-home metabolomics with IOLO's kit, which besides these two metabolites includes 600 plus others. And if you want to use this kit yourself, discount link in the video's description. So what's my data? So starting with the data for plasma levels of indoxyl sulfate, that's there. And then paracresol sulfate, that's also there on the bottom. And these data are from April of 2023 through July of 2024. I have 11 tests. And as you can see by that blue, blue line, the trend line is going in the wrong direction. Ideally, I'd want it to be flat. I want to resist age-related change, even if it's only for a 14 or so or 15 month period. So they're moving in the wrong direction or they have at least more recently. So what's the plan for reducing levels of these metabolites? So for that, let's go to the correlations. So now we're gonna take a look at 11 test correlations for indoxyl and paracresol sulfate with diet. So correlations for indoxyl sulfate and paracresol sulfate there on the right. So how am I able to calculate correlations for diet with these metabolites? What's the approach? And I've documented this in many other videos, most recently for taurine. If you missed that, I'll link to that in the right corner. So following test number 11, I looked at correlations for 
indoxyl sulfate and paracresyl sulfate with 87 foods, macro and micronutrients. And then in terms of what's significant, we go to the p-value. You can see in both cases, they're less than 0.05 on both tables. And this is a partial list. The full list, as for all correlations, is on the correlations tier on Patreon. So if you're interested in that, check it out. In terms of the correlation, we go to the lowercase r. That's the correlation coefficient. Now, the biggest bang for the buck in my, how I'm interpreting this is I'm looking for foods or nutrients that are significantly correlated with both of these metabolites. And in that case, we can see that macadamia nuts have positive correlations for both. In other words, a relatively higher macadamia nut intake is significantly correlated with higher levels of endoxyl and paracresol sulfate in my data. So with that in mind, for test number 13, I've reduced intake of macadamia nuts. And if macadamia nuts somehow are causatively involved, I should expect to see lower levels of endoxyl and paracresol sulfate, or at least the correlation will weaken if that's not the case. Alternatively and inversely, we can see that uh, mushrooms and vitamin B5, so mushrooms are a rich source of vitamin B5, so that's probably the B5 correlation is probably a uh, marker of mushroom intake. We can see that mushrooms and B5 are inversely correlated with endoxyl and paracresol sulfate. So during periods where I've had high intake of mushrooms, levels of these metabolites were relatively low. So with that in mind, for test number 13, I've increased mushroom intake. And note, for a couple, note that for a couple of tests, I reduced mushroom intake to test correlations with homocysteine. And that, it turned out to be maybe a part of the story. So I'm happy to increase mushrooms back up by a bit. So I cut mushroom intake from three 700, bo uh, 700 gram boxes per week to one for the homocysteine experiment. So now I've increased, increased it back to two, not yet fully at three, which will test this correlation. But then the most interesting correlation, or at least to me, on this list is coconut butter. And here too, this is an inverse correlation. So during periods where I've had relatively higher coconut butter intake, that's significantly correlated with lower levels of both of these two metabolites. So now I've said that this is a potentially interesting correlation because now I have a conundrum. And for those who are familiar with the channel, you've seen my videos on Horvath, Horvath, sorry, Horvath's epigenetic age and the DNA methylation uh, based estimation of telomere length, where co uh, coconut butter is inversely correlated with an Horvath epigenetic age. In other words, relatively higher intake of coconut butter is significantly correlated with a younger Horvath epigenetic age. And Horvath's epigenetic clock is the gold standard, and it's the best epigenetic, epigenetic clock for predicting chronological age. And coconut butter is posit uh, positively correlated, sorry, it inversely correlated with a uh, telomere length. So higher coconut butter, is correlated with a shorter telomere length. So that would suggest that coconut butter is bad for those two epigenetic markers. So now we've got the opposite data where a relatively higher coconut butter intake may be better for the levels of these two metabolites that are associated with uh, all-cause mortality risk and damage to the kidney, heart, and endothelium. So I have a conundrum. Do I increase coconut butter, improve levels of these two metabolites, or reduce them, re resist age-related change, but maybe make the epigenetics worse? And then it also raises another question, which do I value more? These metabolite markers, which are uh, markers of what's happening or has recently happened, or the epigenetics, which may be a marker of what can happen rather than what is happening. For now, I'm favoring the metabol metabolomics over the epigenetics, and I'm happy to have that discussion in, in the comments if anyone's interested in more info. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon which includes those biomarker correlations. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while also helping to support the channel, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, Ulta Labs, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, the DNA methylation-based test, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.